Spies are commonplace in the Witcher world. They are as much a part of a kingdom's army as any foot soldier. And as soldiers need a general, so spies need a spy master. For Redania, that spy master was Dijkstra, Sigismund Dijkstra. And on first sight, you wouldn't expect him to be a man of keen intellect and clever strategizing. But Dijkstra was renowned for both. He was a large man, perhaps an understatement, weighing a little under two quintals and standing a near seven foot tall. Dijkstra was a huge man. And in his preferred, brightly colored clothing, he looked like a dimwit on his best days. Nothing was further from the truth. As the head of King Visimir's secret service, Dijkstra had considerable authority. In fact, a popular saying at King Visimir's court held that if Dijkstra states it is noon, yet darkness reigns all around, it is time to start worrying about the fate of the sun. And not without reason. The spymaster had his fingers in every secret, every private conversation, every hidden note, every whispered lie. Dijkstra knew. Just like he always knew when a person lied to him, without fail. And when you lied to Dijkstra, the consequences were nothing to scoff at. Traitors of Redania, bandits, and especially Scoia'tael were taken to Drakenborg, an old Redanian castle convert it into a concentration camp for the aforementioned elves and other enemies of the state. The Dijkstra liked to keep all his enemies close, and in one spot, and dead. Because once he took you to Drakenborg, you would die. You'd spend your last few days guzzling down Dijkstra Riesling, a terribly tasting wine, meant to keep the prisoners tipsy, but you would most certainly die, privately and quickly. Because Dijkstra meant for this to be punishment, not sadistic revenge. Which is why his story is, quite honestly, a somewhat sad one. When we're first introduced to the man, it is through Yennefer. For some time, she worked as an informant for Dijkstra on occasion. And in this capacity, she saved Dandelion from certain torture and uncertain death. Unsurprisingly, Dandelion was also working as an informer for the Redanian Intelligence Service, and Yennefer had come to ask for a report on behalf of Dijkstra, emphasizing that the spymaster expected said report to be in prose this time, not in verse. He wasn't in the mood for clever rhymes, clearly. Unfortunately for Dijkstra, the questions he had for Dandelion weren't queries the poet wanted to answer at that point in time, because most questions pertain to a certain witcher friend Dandelion was known to write a great many ballads about, and although, as it happened, Dijkstra had quite a bit of smut on Dandelion to make him talk, Dandelion wouldn't budge. Having gotten nothing out of our poetic friend then, Dijkstra sent another duo of spies after him, not long after that, when the poet visited the academy in Oxenfurt. And this time, Dandelion was forced to follow along to have a chat with the spymaster himself. During these talks, Philippa Eilhart was also present, as she was Redania's court sorceress at the time, and aided the king in many tasks similar to Dijkstra's. Though it's not something either party likes to talk about much, Dijkstra and Philippa were once romantically involved, for around three years. Or at least they were physical to some degree. Or rather, they weren't entirely unpleasant to one another. Quite honestly, none can really say how deep their relationship went, but suffice to say, there were feelings involved. And Dijkstra often opened letters to the sorceress with Darling Phil, the son of my life. Although it's likely Philippa was merely in the business of using the spy. Regardless, the talks went absolutely nowhere, as expected. Dijkstra and Philippa both threw about some veiled threats and ordered Dandelion to bring Geralt to them when he found the opportunity to do so. And Dandelion intended to do quite the opposite, but that didn't really matter, because Dijkstra already knew the poet wouldn't tell him anything. And so, when Geralt was eventually found, the spymaster was not informed. But Dijkstra found out about every single detail after the fact anyway. He had his ways. Dijkstra, you see, was quite desperately trying to find Cyrilla of Sintra, just like the rest of the world was at the time. And Geralt was the quickest way to find out more about the girl. Problem was, Philippa also wished to find Ciri, just not for the same reasons as Dijkstra. You see, even before the Lodge was officially formed, it was clear that Philippa had already started planning for such an organization. And so, she meant to find Ciri, 
and convince her to join the side of magic. Whereas Dijkstra simply aimed to take her to Redania and keep her there as a powerful peon of sorts to use in his political games whenever he chose to. These differences of opinion wouldn't really come into play until the Second Northern Nilfgaardian War, however, which, if Dijkstra had anything to say about it, wouldn't even have happened as it did. Because Dijkstra was well aware of the Nilfgaardian plans at the time, just before the war, he already knew that Nilfgaard was ready to launch a full-scale attack the moment the North even set so much as a little toe on their land. And Nilfgaard, even worse, knew that the North was about to put on a mummer's performance, a mock battle to make it look like Nilfgaard had attacked the North. The North was about to provoke an all-out war with Nilfgaard, thinking the South was ill-prepared, when in truth, they were anything but. As such, Dijkstra sent a messenger to Demovend to warn him not to go through with their plans. Vizimir to Demovend, you must hold back the disguised troops. There has been a betrayal. The flame has mustered an army in Dol Angra and is only waiting for an excuse. Unfortunately, Demovend never got this message because the poor messenger, Applegat, was shot in the back by a band of Skoyatel, Yaven to be precise, and said messenger died on the spot. The Second War had begun. Still unaware of this fact, during the Thanedile Bowl shortly after, Dijkstra attended the party as Philippa's second. Although at this point, the sorceress had already begun playing her own games, of course. But Dijkstra either did not know this just yet, and didn't want to know it, or he kept up appearances to get his hands on any information he could. The latter seems the most obvious, and where better to find such information than at a high society mage convention? To that end, he paraded around the ball, listening in on conversations, asking probing questions, and complaining about the available food with Geralt, because they both sincerely preferred large pieces of meat they could eat with their hands, and a lot of beer. Now you might wonder if a man such as he wouldn't look out of place among the high society of the sorcerer community, just like Geralt, in fact, and you'd be right. He would, which is why he pretended to be a count, as ordered by Vizimir, so as not to irk the magicians with his plebeian descent. And so, in his role as Count of the Redanian Kingdom, he kept his eyes and ears open, watching for details that would give the other spies away. He noticed, therefore, that no crowned heads attended the Aratuza Ball, just their spies. A sure sign that something was amiss. He just didn't quite know what, yet. But through his myriad of observations, he'd guessed, correctly, that Vilgefortz would want to talk to Geralt privately within an hour of the banquet's start. Of course, Dijkstra doesn't always tell us everything, but he likely already had a hunch that Vilgefortz wasn't batting for the north any longer, but for Nilfgaard. When night fell, the northern mages, aided by Dijkstra, identified and captured many of the traitors among sorcerer society who had joined the Nilfgaardian side, all in secret, of course. Poor, unfortunate Geralt wasn't aware of anything going on either, so when he stumbled upon a group of mages detaining one such traitor, he was visibly confused. But what's more important, he wasn't supposed to know about this operation in the first place. After Triss blinded Geralt to ensure he wouldn't see too much, Dijkstra jumped in to convince Philippa not to take any further measures, as the poor boy hadn't witnessed most of it anyway. Successful in his efforts, Dijkstra walked away from the scene with his prizes in tow. Firstly, a list of Redanian traitors on the Nilfgaardian payroll, as gifted to him by Philippa for his aid in the operation, and Geralt of Rivia, whom he intended to grill on the whereabouts of Ciri post-haste. As the rebellion on Thanet Isle raged on, Dijkstra took Geralt down the stairs, starting towards Loxia all the while attempting to convince Geralt to hand Ciri over to him at his earliest convenience. He assured the Witcher that Ciri would be safe in Redania. It was for the best, really, and she was far more valuable to the North alive than dead. But Geralt had other plans in mind. After a brief distraction and an even shorter fight, during which Geralt knocks the wind straight out of Dijkstra and his men, Dandelion runs up the stairs to warn Geralt that Ciri is in danger. Not wanting to be followed when our witcher goes after his adopted daughter, Geralt casually breaks Dijkstra's ankle with a loud crack and a scream from the spy. And that was that, as far as Thanet goes for him. 
Afterwards, he couldn't walk for two weeks, and even then, the only reason he could walk now was because he had to beg Philippa to help heal his ankle through magical means. Otherwise, he'd still be limping. Not a great situation to be in, given that, by this point, Dijkstra and Philippa had grown well and truly apart. They each had their own designs for Ciri, and they each kept many other secrets from the other. To his credit, Dijkstra was still unwilling to use the power at his disposal to take some form of revenge on Geralt, although that didn't mean the spy wasn't furious at him. Ori Reuven cleared his throat again, involuntarily glancing under the table towards his boss's leg. Dijkstra noticed the look. That's right, I won't let him get away with that, he barked. I couldn't walk for two weeks because of him, I lost face with Philippa, forced to whimper like a dog and beg her for a bloody spell. Otherwise I'd still be hobbling. I can't blame anyone but myself, I underestimated him. But the worst thing is that I can't get my own back and tan his witcher's hide. I don't have the time. And anyway, I can't use my own men to settle private scores. That's right, isn't it, Ori? <clears throat> don't grunt at me, I know. But hell, power tempts. How it beguiles, invites to be made use of. How easy it is to forget when one has it. But if you forget once, there's no end to it. Abuse of power aside, the Second War had begun, and Nilfgaard needed to be dealt with. So, Dijkstra got to work. Hiring some children to throw rocks at the Redanian house of a Nilfgaardian officer, grumbling about dwarves not disclosing the details of some of their accounts, and further grumbling about Philippa. Of course, because though they had parted ways, so to speak, Dijkstra still seemed hung up about her, and perhaps not just the lack of information he gained from her. Oh, you're boring me, Ori. Right, I said. Darling Phil, the son of my... Oh, blast. I keep forgetting. Take a new sheet of paper. Ready? Of course. <clears throat> Dear Philippa, Mistress Triss Marigold is... Sure to be worried about the witcher she teleported from Thana to Broccolon, which she kept so secret that even I didn't know anything. It hurt me terribly. Please reassure her the witcher is doing well. I would like to think, Phil, that you don't have any evidence of Yennefer's betrayal, and you don't know where she is hiding. It would hurt me greatly to discover this is the latest secret being concealed from me. I have no secrets from you. What are you sniggering about, Ori? Oh, nothing. <clears throat> Indeed, without Philippa, there were quite a few things that eluded the spy. He was still under the impression that the fake Ciri that had showed up in Nilfgaard, unexpectedly, was the real Ciri. Yennefer was an even bigger mystery to him, though he had all sorts of theories surrounding her, too, as he still assumed she was a spy for Nilfgaard, too. And then there was another mystery, Cahir ap Kailach, a Nilfgaardian who was hunted by Nilfgaardians. Dijkstra didn't know much about Cahir, but when the Nilfgaardian ambassador came knocking, asking about Cahir, it certainly piqued the spy's interest, even if he had to sit through a visit from Shilad Fitzustelen to even find out about it. Because Dijkstra did not like the Nilfgaardian ambassador, and not just because he was a Nilfgaardian. Schillard had a habit of talking in diplomatic terms while weaving pompous language and paradoxical turns of phrase into sentences, intelligible only to diplomats and scholars. And although Dijkstra had himself studied at the Academy of Oxenford, he had not obtained a master's degree. So many diplomats and other such dignitaries no doubt thought they could run circles around a simple spymaster. But Dijkstra did know the basics of the jargon spoken by academics, much as he loathed to use it himself. He couldn't stand pomp and ceremony, or any of that sort of pretension, though platitudes bored him equally. Turn a phrase aside, at the time of Shillard's arrival, the King of Redania had been assassinated, of course. The court sorceress, Philippa, had moved her operation to Monte Calvo, where she led the lodge, and both the Redanian queen and prince were in no position to rule the land while most of the north was quite stuck in the chaos that is war. And although technically speaking, the Regency Council, a group of aristocrats, was meant to govern Redania in this time of need, they weren't exactly the most reliable group of people. In fact, they would turn either tail or coat at the drop of a hat. So for the time being, 
Dijkstra was the de facto leader of Redania, be it reluctantly. He was so important, in fact, that one would address him as Your Majesty. Your Majesty would be best, Dijkstra replied modestly. You are aware, after all, Your Excellency, that the king is judged by his court, and you are probably aware that when I shout jump, the court in Tretagor asks how high. The ambassador knew that Dijkstra was exaggerating, but not inordinately. Prince Radovit was still a minor, Queen Hedwig distraught by her husband's tragic death, and the aristocracy intimidated, stupefied, at variance and divided into factions. Dijkstra was the de facto governor of Redania, and could have taken any rank he pleased with no difficulty. But Dijkstra had no desire to do so. Now, the Nilfgaardian ambassador had not arrived in Tretagor by chance. Dijkstra had invited him there to kick him out. Now that he knew about the Nilfgaardian spy network active in Redania, Schillard was a persona non grata in the kingdom. During their little chat, Dijkstra threw a heap of accusations at Schillard, and Schillard threw some back in equal amounts, all shrouded in the veil of courtesy, of course. Having found out about Cahir during their meeting, Dijkstra now once again turned to Philippa to inquire about this new mystery in his life, though he has his own theories too, as he does. And as Philippa doesn't give him the answers he seeks, he continues the search on his own. The search, still mainly for Ciri and any Nilfgaardian traitors. Most importantly of those is Vilgefortz. Occasionally he would find hideouts he'd personally investigate, and one such hideout most certainly belonged. To Vilgefortz himself. This particular hideout showed evidence of torturous experiments on young pregnant girls. The dungeons of the castle, or what was left of it, were so vile that Dijkstra's agents could barely look at it without feeling queasy. Even Dijkstra's stomach couldn't quite believe the sights. Naked, mutilated bodies everywhere. And this discovery proved to permanently shake Dijkstra's trust in magicians. Under no circumstances, Dijkstra said, swinging around. Not a word about what's been found here, to anyone, particularly not to any mages. I'm beginning to lose faith in them after what I've seen here. Dijkstra was furious at his findings, and although there was no evidence to suggest it directly, Dijkstra was so intensely sure that it had been Vilgefortz's hideout, he ordered his agents to fabricate the evidence. The torture chair meant for Siri set him off in particular. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for the war to reach the borders of Redania, and Dijkstra decided it was time to grow an army capable of repelling the southern invader for good. Trouble was, Redania barely had enough money to fund half such an army. They needed to find a way to grow their numbers. To that end, Dijkstra took a trip to the kingdom of Kovir. Kovir was by far the richest kingdom in the north, and if anyone could aid their ailing treasury, it was King Estadat Tyson of Kovir. And to Dijkstra's surprise, Estadat himself showed up to address the spymaster's request. Estadat already knew that Dijkstra's plan was to bribe the Koviri officials to secure the money, and so directly asked the spy about it. And Dijkstra admitted to the potential bribe without even flinching. He even gave him the number he was meant to be bribing with. Which is precisely why Estherat was so fond of him. And that is why I like you, Estherat Tyson said after a moment's silence. You're a dreadful whoreson. You remind me of my youth. I look at you and see myself at your age. Dijkstra thanked him with a bow. He was just eight years younger than the king. He was convinced that Estherat was well aware of it. You're a dreadful whoreson, the king repeated, growing serious but a respectable and decent one, and that's a rarity in these rotten times. And as their conversation moves on, he continues, You, Dijkstra, are also unscrupulous in your use of intrigue, bribery, blackmail and torture. You don't bat an eyelid when condemning someone to death or ordering an assassination. The fact you do it for the kingdom you faithfully serve does not excuse you or make you any more pleasant in my eyes. Not in the slightest. Be aware of that. The spy nodded as a sign that he was. You are, though, Estherat continued, as it's been said before, a whoreson of upright character. And that's why I like and respect you. 
why I have granted you a private audience. For you, Dijkstra, having had a million opportunities, have never done anything for private gain or stolen so much as a halfpenny from the state coffers. Not even a farthing. Suleika, look. Is he blushing? Or am I deceived? The queen raised her head from her crocheting. Their righteousness shall be known from their modesty. She quoted a passage from the good book, although she must have seen that not even a trace of a blush had appeared on the spy's features. But as fond as Estrat was of Dijkstra, Kovir was neutral and always would be. What's more, they had signed a pact with Nilfgaard. They couldn't just go about funding the war effort on either side. And Estrat proclaimed so quite loudly, in fact. Loud enough so that every Nilfgaardian spy in the kingdom could hear it. Thankfully, after some advice from his queen, Estrat found a clever way to get some Koviri coins into the Redanian coffers anyway. A cool one million Byzants, the Koviri currency. After their last meeting, Estrat warns Dijkstra not to trust wizards. Philippa in particular. And Estrat knew things most did not. He may have been one of the few royals with some knowledge of the lodge and its schemes. However, it is at this point that Dijkstra reveals that he never trusted Philippa anyway, ever. He simply kept her around because without her, Redania would sink into chaos and disappear. That is true, but if I may advise you, loosen your grip a little. You know of what I speak. Scaffolds and torture chambers throughout the land, atrocities perpetrated against elves, and that dreadful fort, Drakenborg. I know you do it out of patriotism, but you are building yourself an evil legend. In it, you're a werewolf lapping up innocent blood. Someone has to do it, and someone has to bear the consequences. I know you endeavor to be just, but you can't avoid mistakes, can you? For they can't be avoided. Neither can you remain clean when you're slopping around in blood. I know you've never harmed anybody for self-interest, but who will believe that? Who will want to believe that? The day that fate turns, they'll attribute the murder of innocent people to you. And worse, claim you profited from it. And lying sticks to a fellow like Tar. I know. They won't give you a chance to defend yourself. People like you aren't given chances. They'll tar you. But later, after the fact, beware, Dijkstra. I shall. They won't get me. They got your king, Vizimir. With a dagger plunged up to the guard in his flank, I heard. It's easier to stab a king than a spy. They won't get me. They'll never get me. History does what it does, and the extra soldiers bought with Koviri coin, raised by Dijkstra himself, secured a resounding victory for the northern armies. Nilfgaard was defeated, and peace talks ensued. However, our story isn't quite over. Before Geralt left to find Ciri, he penned a certain letter. Wait. Geralt wheeled his horse around and rode closer to Pegasus. He took a letter surreptitiously from his bosom. Make sure this letter reaches. Fringila Vigo? No. Dijkstra. Are you serious, Geralt? And how do you propose I do it? Find a way. I know you will. And now farewell. Give us a hug, you old fool. Now... What precisely is said in this letter isn't known. However, it is my honest guess that it contained the location of Ciri. In case Geralt didn't return, in case he failed in saving Ciri and Yennefer, he trusted Dijkstra most of all to save her in his stead. However, it's reasonably certain that Dijkstra then forwarded this information to none other than Emir Va Emris, Emperor of Nilfgaard. Amir, who quite suddenly found and attacked Vilgefortz's final hideout in the end. Not quite so suddenly, after all. Dijkstra knew what Vilgefortz's plans for Ciri were. He had seen the torture chair. And while he was still dealing with the end of the war, he couldn't possibly use his time to go after Ciri personally, or muster an army to do so. But Amir Va Emris, he would drop anything and everything to go after his daughter. And Amir now owed a debt to Dijkstra, felt he simply had to return the favor. And as the information provided was of such exceptional value, something equally exceptional would have to be offered in return. Because what was the information sent again? The location of Stiga Castle, 
Vilgefortz's hideout. Certainly much of value could be found in such a hideout. Secret correspondence, theories, notes, and perhaps even diary entries. In this case, correspondence with Philippa Eilhart, I'd wager. Philippa Eilhart looked around to see that no one was listening, then leaned over towards Dijkstra. What do you want to talk to me about? The spy also looked around. About the assassination of King Visimir carried out last July. I beg your pardon, the half-elf who committed that murder. Dijkstra lowered his voice even more. Was by no means a madman, Phil, and wasn't acting alone. What are you saying? Hush. Dijkstra smiled. Hush, Phil. Don't call me Phil. Do you have any proof? What kind? Where did you get it? You'd be surprised, Phil, if I told you where. When can I expect an audience, honorable lady? Philippa Eilhart's eyes were like two black, bottomless lakes. Soon, Dijkstra. During the chase of Rienz in Oxenfurt, Philippa got one of Rienz's underlings alone for but a moment, and this particular underling told her everything she needed to know about Rienz's master. He told her his master was Vilgefortz. And then she killed this poor, unfortunate underling, taking that information with her, withholding it from everyone. Why would she do that? Again, this is a theory, of course, but I suspect she wished to collaborate with the mage. Philippa wanted Ciri for the lodge. Vilgefortz was very powerful and intensely clever. If they were to join forces, they would stand a much better chance of finding the girl. Philippa could simply strike a deal to obtain Ciri, shall we say, after Vilgefortz was done with her, as undamaged as possible, because Philippa merely saw Ciri as a tool, a means to an end. This would very clearly explain why Philippa seemed so bothered by Dijkstra's revelation about the half-elf's accomplices. She no doubt suspected he may know of her dealings with Vilgefortz, and given that during this time, Philippa had already started putting the Lodge's interests above those of Redania. It is equally likely that she knew full well of Vilgefortz's plans to assassinate the King of Redania, Visimir. On top of this information, however, Dijkstra had gotten his hands on something else. Information on the Lodge. I have to talk to you, Phil. Philippa frowned. In private, most probably? That would be best. Dijkstra smiled faintly. If, however, you consider it appropriate, I'll agree to a few additional pairs of eyes. Let's say those of the beautiful ladies of Monte Calvo. Hush! hissed the sorceress from behind her smiling lips. When can I expect an audience? I'll think about it and let you know. Now leave me in peace. This is a stately ceremony. It's a great celebration. Let me remind you of that if you hadn't noticed yourself. A great celebration. We're on the threshold of a new era, Dijkstra. The spy shrugged. The crowd cheered. Fireworks shot into the sky. The bells of Novigrad tolled. Tolled for the triumph, for the glory. But somehow they sounded strangely mournful. Vilgefortz would have known about the lodge as well. For a sorcerer of his renown, it wasn't all too difficult. Although Philippa may very well have simply divulged her lodge plans to him as well, regardless. Some might say that the information Emir provided to Dijkstra was of the imminent assassination attempt. But I highly doubt that. If that was indeed the case, Dijkstra would not have been so forward with his queries in regards to Philippa. And by that time, he would have already had the information. Coincidentally, when we see things from Philippa's perspective, she also notes in her mind that she would still like to keep Dijkstra around for as long as is required, which means she hadn't quite started plotting against him yet. Not to mention that later, Dijkstra laments having said one word too many to one person too many. That person was Philippa. He should not have disclosed to her that he was aware of the lodge. He knew too much. And now she knew that too. Dijkstra had the means to blackmail Philippa now. His mistake was to refuse to believe that she would go as far as killing him to buy his silence. He was wrong. They came out of the shadows, out of the darkness, 
dressed in black, masked as nimble as rats. The sentries and bodyguards from the antechamber dropped without moaning under the quick thrusts of daggers with narrow, angular blades. Blood flowed over the floors of Tretagore Castle, spilled over the tiles, stained the woodblocks, soaked into the Wengerbergian carpets. They approached along all the corridors and left corpses behind them. He's there, said one of them, pointing. The scarf shrouding his face up to his eyes muffled his voice. He went in there, through the chancery where Reuven, that coughing old coot, works. There's no way out of there. The eyes of the other one, the commander, shone in the slits of his black velvet mask. The chamber behind the chancery is windowless. There's no way out. All the other corridors are covered, all the doors and windows. He can't escape. He's trapped. Forward! The door gave away to kicks. Daggers flashed. Death! Death to the bloody killer! Ori Reuven raised his myopic, watery eyes above the papers. Yes? How can I... <clears throat> help you, gentlemen? The murderers smashed open the door to Dijkstra's private chambers, scurried around them like rats, searching through all the nooks and crannies, Tapestries, paintings, and panels were torn from the walls, fell onto the floor. Daggers slashed curtains and upholsteries. He's not here! yelled one of them, rushing into the chancery. He's not here! Unfortunately for Dijkstra's trusty assistant, Ori Reuven, the assassins never found his master. And so, Dijkstra's disappearance saw poor old Ori thrown into prison for six years, interrogated almost constantly by various investigators, and once free, he lived for a mere year before dying in the poorhouse, in misery, forgotten. His master, though, well, he fled towards Zerikania, of course, where all outcasts go to escape their fate. On the way there, he ran into two other such outcasts, Boreas Mun, an ex-soldier under Vilgefortz's command, though indirectly, and Isengrim Falcharna, previously the Freyhead Brigade Grand Leader. They met at a fire, ate together, shared stories, and then travelled onwards together as well. It is here, among these newfound friends, Sigismund Dijkstra adopts his new name, Siggy Reuven, a combination of his old name and that of his old assistant. And under this name, he travelled through Zarykania for a time, doing all manner of things, no doubt, amongst which winning his own personal troll, Bart, in a card game from a camel merchant. And when he did eventually make his way back to the Northern Realms, he chose to keep his new name, Siggy Reuven. And instead of returning to Redania, he settled in Novigrad, a free city. Once there, he wasted no time in making a name for himself in the criminal underworld, and soon became one of the four most menacing crime lords the town had to offer. Political ties all but washed away, he now used his connections and intimidation tactics to grow his fortune and fame, until one day he ran into Geralt of Rivia once more. Geralt of Rivia, who needed his help in finding Ciri. Ironic, really. As chance would have it, Dijkstra had just lost a rather sizable fortune and needed help recovering that, and so they struck a deal and helped each other as they could or rather found it necessary to do so, to Dijkstra's dismay, because he still had to soak his ankle in hot water at least six times a day, or it would hurt like hell. Indeed, Dijkstra was a rather busy individual during his time in Novigrad, aiding the oppressed mages where he could, searching for his treasure, fighting out crime wars, chasing after Philippa for some well-deserved payback, and lest we forget, plotting to kill King Radovid of Redania alongside Roach of Temeria, so Dijkstra could lead the Kingdom of Redania himself. Now, unfortunately, I cannot tell you which of the following endings to our illustrious spymaster is the true one, because there are two very differing paths indeed. If all goes well for him, he succeeds in killing Radovid, and alongside him, his fellow conspirators, the Temerians, so he might take his place on the throne himself. If things go particularly badly, he will instead be killed by Geralt of Rivia, or on yet another path, his plotting never bears fruit at all, and he continues his crime lord ways. None can say for sure, of course. But with that, Dijkstra's story comes to an end. At least, for now.